This show is listener supported. You are listening to Adoptees On, the podcast where adoptees discuss the adoption experience. This is season four, episode nine, Stephanie. I'm your host, Haley Radke. Today, we talk about what happens when two adopted people get married to each other. Stephanie is candid with us about her relationship, some of what triggers her and her husband, and how that can escalate quickly. She also shares about how IFS, that's Internal Family Systems Therapy, has been a game changer for their relationship. If you're interested in learning more about IFS, the episode just prior to this is all about that therapy model and why it's so effective for adoptees in particular. Stephanie and I wrap up with some recommended resources, and as always, links to everything we'll be talking about today are on the website adopteeson.com. Let's listen in. I'm so pleased to welcome to Adoptees On, Stephanie Harris. Welcome, Stephanie. It's a pleasure being here. Thank you. I'm really excited to talk with you today and get to hear more of your story. And I especially asked you here because you are adopted yourself and you're also married to an adoptee. So we're going to focus in on that relationship. But why don't we start out? Would you share your story with us? Sure, I will. Uh, I was adopted as a newborn straight from the hospital in Kentucky near Fort Knox, Kentucky. My adopted parents was acquainted with my birth mother. They didn't know one another very well, but they they knew of one another. And only thing they knew was she was going to put me in the Catholic charities, maybe the orphanage services, uh, relinquish me to them. And then it was like a last minute decision that they had found out about me. And they actually just came to the hospital, picked me up and took me home. And my, uh, my dad always has a lot of humor with saying that it only cost $75 <laughs> for the attorney. <laughs> It was it was a private adoption that and she also lived in the same small town where I I was adopted. So I was raised where my birth mother and seven of her children, which would have been my half siblings, lived within seven to ten miles apart. And that I never knew until I was approximately nine or 10 years old that I was adopted. I had no idea. I believe it was meant to be an open adoption, but it was kind of a secret open adoption. Did your birth mother parent those other siblings? Yes. So you have a bunch of older siblings? Yes. Okay. Seven. Wow. I was, I was the youngest one. And mm-hmm. I, it was very, it's very complicated, but it is um, part of adoption, which is complication, Mm -hmm. a lot of complications. So, so you found out you were adopted when you were nine or 10 and did you find out your connection to her in your town and these siblings? Yes, it was a quite traumatic event. Actually, I was raised around my cousins, but I had no idea they were my cousins. I thought they were just my best friends. And they invited me to their family reunion. And when I got there, it was actually my birth mother's home. And it was my siblings, half siblings, and my cousins. And I recall sitting at the picnic table talking about my mom and dad. And I remember someone saying, that's not your mom and you don't even have a dad. These are actually your siblings, your cousins, and here's your birth mother. So it was very difficult. I believe I was in shock. And I did not want to be there. I knew that. I was very scared and confused, of Mm -hmm. course. 
Oh my goodness. So what happened next? Did you talk to your parents about what happened? Yes. Did you ask them like, what is going on here? Yes. So I remember going home and telling them what happened. I think they already knew what happened before I even, I believe the news hit (laughs) before I even arrived home, what happened. So when I got home, all I remember is my mother crying, very upset, and my father upset. And I was shut down. They didn't blame me, but I felt as though I did something wrong. So there was a seed planted that this is a secret that I'm adopted. It's a secret that I must be special because that's all they told me was they said, you know, we've always told you we're adopted because we told you you were special. (laughs) So that was their way of saying that I was adopted by telling me that I was special. Yeah, which was, is very, very different. Of course, I was born in 1969, so this was in the mid-70s. They didn't have resources, of course, to understand adoption, nor did they ever have any type of counseling on for an adopted child mm-hmm. or how to tell me. So they, I guess they felt as though I would eventually find out and they would take care of it. But I shut down at that moment in time, and I felt as though... I didn't have a voice. It wasn't intentional, but that is the way it happened. Mm -hmm. No one intended to hurt me. They just wanted, they felt as though I needed to know the truth, but there was pain involved, of course. Okay. So the person that disclosed to you that you were adopted said, you don't have a father. So correct. Yes. They didn't know who your birth father was. How did you come to discover that information? I met my birth mother and took her out to eat. I didn't meet her then. Of course, we had a relationship. I tried to get closer with her and my siblings. And I had a very difficult time connecting with her and my half-siblings, all of them. And I wasn't sure why. I just felt as though I didn't look like them. I didn't connect with them. It wasn't nothing negative that I felt about them. It's just I felt as though I didn't belong with them. So that was very difficult, I'm sure, for them. They felt rejected by me. And so they don't really think of me highly to this day, I believe. Mm. Most of them don't. So when I took my uh, birth mother uh, out for dinner, you know, I had asked her who my birth father was, his identity. And her reaction was, well, the reason I relinquished you, she didn't say relinquished, but the reason why I basically gave you up for adoption is because I found out that your your father is not a white man. So I was very confused, of course, again, and shocked. Part of me wasn't super shocked, but most of myself was, you know, I was shocked again. She had his name. She gave me his name, and the search continued on, and I was 30 years old. Mm. So what did you do next? I contacted him. There was a lot of rejection, naturally. So I took it upon myself to get a ticket from Kentucky to Reno, Nevada. (laughs) And I showed up on his doorstep. In which, I must say, I don't recommend. My, I have an, uh, another sister. She's seven years older than me. And she went with me for support. 
so we just uh, went to Lake Tahoe and we enjoyed Lake Tahoe and <laughs> some outside concerts <laughs> in Reno. <laughs> So have you ever been in touch with him then, like past that, like in person? Yes. Okay. Yes, that's correct. Yes, I have. Once I went home, I wrote him a letter instead of make another trip to Reno, Nevada for phone calls. I uh, And then he contacted me. And then in, within a few months, I was headed back to Reno and I met him for the first time. And I went by myself. And it was a an amazing reunion for us. It was very private, but he still kept me, of course, at a distance. And he was able to share with me the history of his history and our ancestors. So it, it was, um, and I actually felt connected to him. I felt very close to him, not emotionally. But, you know, looking in the mirror for many years, you're not knowing who you look like or have a connection with. I was able to look at him and I see that connection Mm. very well. Mm -hmm. And that went on for uh, several years. We visit him in Reno three or four times total. Well, why don't we shift and what? How can, do you want to tell us, how did you meet your husband? I came out of a uh, marriage of 15 years, and I was single for, I want to say, f- around four years. So I met my husband at a bar, and he was actually a designated driver because I didn't want anyone that drank, did drugs or anything like that. I wanted a nice, clean man, and he was very handsome. We connected immediately, and then we went out on a date the following day, and he told me he was adopted, and it was like, uh, it was an instant connection, and then we like got married like seven weeks later. Whoa. In which I don't recommend <laughs> as well. Okay. Wow. I did not know this was a whirlwind. Okay. So you share that you're adopted, you fall in love, you are in lust. married seven weeks later. Oh, okay. Thank you for correcting me. Fall in lust. Yes. Okay. So married seven weeks later. And how long have you guys been married? We will be married 12 years, November of this year. So... You say, I don't recommend seven weeks. What does that mean? Did you guys have some bumpy spots? <laughs> well, we now love each other. Okay. Okay. So that's good. Yes, we now love each other. I believe in the beginning we thought we loved each other, but I believe what we loved was the similarities in our life as being adoptees of Knowing the feelings of abandonment, rejection issues, being connected, understanding the loss and trauma of the adoption. And so your husband, had he searched? Did he know his his first parents? Did Had you guys followed a similar path in that respect as well? No, not at all. He had no desire to know. And his, he was a foster child, and then he was adopted by his foster parents. And he had absolutely no desire to know his biological families until I pressured him to find out. And there was a mistake on my part. I felt as though I was basically wanting him to feel of the type of reunion I had. I wanted him to feel the same way, but it was too early and he was not ready, Mm. which caused quite a bit of pressure with him, of course, because he wasn't ready to find out. With those things that you have in common, the trauma and the rejection issues, and I mean, to me, that looks like a storm is coming. Mm Mm-hmm. When do you realize, like, these are the things that brought us together, but this is going to 
racket us. Yes, because I was projecting of all of the therapy that I have been through, of years of therapy, of healing. I was projecting that upon him as though he should feel the same way. And he was not feeling that way. He was not ready. So he did find his his first mother and it went really well. That was just like, I believe, four years ago. It went really well in the beginning. And there's also some similarities with his adoption. It's with mine also. That's very, very bizarre. When he found his birth mother, he also found out that he was mixed biracial. He had no clue. And he has eight other half siblings. Whoa. Yes. So it was very, very bizarre. And no one knew about him. He was, it was very well kept hidden. And he is three years older than I am. So he was born in 66. So he, he didn't know he was biracial. And no, you, you look, his mother is biracial. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. And so you look, Sorry if this is going to be rude, mm-hmm. but you present more white than biracial, right? You can pass for. Yes. Um, and then I've seen photos of your husband and he's a lot darker skinned. So that's why it was kind of a. Yes. I'm assuming that's why it was more of a surprise for him. Yes. Okay. Very much. Very much so. Yes. And so when you guys are processing this because you found out you're biracial and he finds out his like. What are some of the things that you guys are talking about or thinking about when this is happening? It was a whirlwind then because I remember we remember like going to the courthouse, picking up his adoption records that were released by the judge. And we were reading the paperwork and we were like, well, this is the wrong person because there's no way my husband is biracial. According to the, this must be his brother that was also adopted. <laughs> mm. This must be the, they have, this has been some confusion. There's no way that this is my husband's adoption records. So once I had the name of his first mother, I went researching and I found her within a, several hours. And I was able to be in contact with her I believe within a week or so. And then within two weeks, he went to visit her. And things went well for uh, six to eight months. And then after that, there's, he had, he chose to no longer be in contact. Okay. So he has this, you know, brief reunion. And I mean, this, this is all really big stuff just for one person going through, but you intimately know how this affects an adoptee's psyche and what is this doing with your relationship? Is it bringing you closer together, more understanding, or is it pushing you apart? Well, first of all, I believe as an adoptee in going through therapy, you want to search for the truth and you want to live in truth. And you don't want any type of falseness lies in your relationships, whether it's work, friends, and of course, our marriage. So we were living in the truth and the truth hurts. So it's, there was a lot of pain for him in his discovery. And I had a hard time understanding it because it was a di- he he came from a different there was still some different feelings it was a different type of trauma and loss i mean it was just, it was a trauma and loss but it felt different to him mm. his reunion felt he had no connection at all like he felt completely disconnected with them and he as though he didn't belong and and it made him angry. And there was some false information given to him and he didn't want to deal with any type of lies. So he just shut them out. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of anger with that. Uh, It's, it's been constant work 
with us in a relationship, to answer your question, we bounce off of one another with our triggers. For an example, if he texts me and I'm at work and I'm really busy, if he doesn't hear back from me, he's concerned that something's wrong. <laughs> uh, rejection, abandonment, or something bad happened to me. And the same with me as well. That's, a, that's one example. And also we, we just kind of like bounce off of one of those triggers with studying uh, IFS therapy, which... That's um, internal family systems. Yes, correct. We have done that for years. That has really helped in the adopt. It's an excellent adoption therapy. And of course, individual for your individual therapy as well and for the marriages. So doing that, you go in and you try to understand all of the parts that are inside of us, our child part, our teen, our critical part, our caretaker our minimizer. We have all these parts working to protect our child that was lost, that is traumatized from the law you know, of loss, rejection, abandonment issues. So all those parts come out, of course, in any relationship. I believe it's magnified in our relationship because we were being triggered with each other's rejections abandonment issues, uh, not listening, being heard, you know, like uh, I like to have a voice and I like to be heard. So I have a hard time like shutting up (laughs) and getting my point across. I like to repeat to get my point across. So for him, that triggers him because coming from an abusive family that he came from, he was uh, triggered by someone repeating the same thing over and over again. So it doesn't kind of like fire and ice in a way. Mm. Yeah, so we are working on uh, trying to identify our parts and our triggers and being still to, and listening to our parts, mm. slowing down. And we're also uh, allowing one another to say, hey, you know, um, there you go again. You're like, tr- you're like repeating yourself over and over again to get your point across. And I know you want to be heard, but it's really like making me want to run and shut down. So you're learning just how to say those things out loud to the other person to be understood and did you yes. did you learn those techniques in doing IFS together? Yes, correct. Yes, mm-hmm. doing IFS together. Yes. I will have aired an episode healing series episode about internal family systems before this show goes up. So I'll link to that in the show notes. But the therapist did a really good job of explaining a little bit more in depth of, about that. But I think it's so interesting that you are doing that work you know, on yourself, but also together. I mean, that's amazing. So you're, you know, sometimes I I feel like a lot of us who are in therapy and we're sort of working on ourselves and we're, you know, hopefully moving forward, we often often are, are leaving a partner behind that is stuck and maybe not working on their stuff. And so the fact that you're both doing this together, I mean, that's really incredible. And it's a good example for us, I really believe. Yes, it is. Yes. It's, it is a work in progress. It really, it's a daily work in progress. I mean, we're going to make it, but there's times where we are like, well, it's like, it's tough being married to an adult. Marriage is tough, period. And then when you have two adoptees, that have maximum rejection and abandonment issues, and neither one was hurt as a child, it is very difficult because you're constantly bouncing off of one another's emotions and then also slowing down learning how to react is really important. 
can you give us an example of maybe a discussion that you guys have had that really only two adopted people would have that were married to each other? You know, because I <laughs> reason the reason I'm asking is because you know I'm my partner is not adopted. He's he's he understands a lot more about adoptee issues um, because of what I do, but. I still feel like I'm always the one trying to explain things. Well, are there things that you guys sort of cycle back to? You know, you, you mentioned that you were adopted as an infant straight out of the hospital. Yes. And then your husband was in foster care for a period of time and then was adopted by his foster family. But, you know, we've talked before about how even a period of time in care just exacerbates our trauma. Are there things that you've discussed about that? I mean, I know we're comparing apples and oranges, but still, I think that's, you know, something to that might have come up for you. Well, I could tell one thing that would be for both of us being in reunion and the reactions to our adopted families, finding out that we have been in reunion have been very similar. And then our first families, their reactions as well have been very similar. So we both understand like this is probably going to happen. I'm letting him know like, you know, your adoptive families are going to be, they're going to have a very hard time understanding why you are even wanting to find your, your identity, who you may look like, how do you walk a certain way, your You know, examples like that. Just the very simple things of where do we get our eye color from? How, why is our butt so big? (laughs) You know, things like that. We can understand that together and letting him know that there's going to be some rejection from uh, the adopted side of our families and the biological sides of our families. They're going to go through certain emotions of jealousy and under, not understanding why why all of a sudden you just, you're here and what do you want or what can I get from you? We do definitely understand. We both have experienced that in our relationships and we both get it together. Like we know. And we also know if I haven't heard from like say a sibling in a while and all of a sudden I hear from him. I'm so excited and like, yes, I, he said hello to me, mm. you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so good. So he would understand. He understands how much I needed that validation from a, a sibling or how much I need a validation of my adopted sister that's seven years older than me, that, you know, we grew up in the same home. She's not adopted. Uh, I was the only one adopted. But the validation of her understanding and appreciating uh, how I feel of wanting to even search for my identity. Mm -hmm. I mean, we both understand the seriousness of it. And we're also, we both understand the complexity of it all and what it can happen in the, in the stages as well as that we go through, you know, we, we go through the honeymoon stage and we go through the confusion stage and then we'll go through backing off for a while. Not all families do this, I believe, but for, you know, I did and he has as well. Mm -hmm. So can you remember any particular moments in your IFS therapy where either one of you sort of discovered something and that really like unlocked something for you. The reason why I'm asking this, so when the IFS therapist explained these things to me and, and I, like I said, I'll link to that episode. She talked about the session where mostly she's just there to guide the client as they are processing things 
internally and, and verbally, I'm assuming, so that you guys both know what's going on. So is there is there any moments that you can remember where you or your husband had an insight and you both were just like, whoa, this this is going to change things for us? Uh, yes. I believe there was a uh, a session where he was very angry why I wasn't understanding him not wanting to no longer contact his birth mother. <laughs> okay. There was a session. It was very intense. And I wasn't listening to him. So his part felt as though I was, let me explain this. So to protect his child, he had a part came up that was, it's called a teen part. And that teen reacts. <laughs> he, his teen is an <laughs> big time. And like, he's very sharp tongue, smart and get loud. And then it would like trigger me into being scared as it, my child. It would scare me as though I was mm -hmm. in danger. Like something bad is going to happen. That was like a, it's a very huge eye opening experience for both of us because I was not validating how he felt. So he had a part that came up that was his teen and his teen part was scaring my child part that was scared of something bad is going to happen. And so in that moment, when you guys finally figure this out, okay, this is kind of a, a bad loop we're in. How, how are you able to get out of that then? We identify the part that is triggering us and we acknowledge that part. Like even to this day, like we, we will speak in parts. He will say, look, you know, what you're saying is it's like my teen part is having a reaction to what you're saying. And I'm like, okay, I appreciate you telling me that. Or he's like, my critical part is really high today. So it's, I am having a hard time with my critical part. So I'm really angry with myself today. You know, he, you know, he's saying, I'm really angry with myself today because my critical part is really wide open. So I just want to let you know. So that helps me understand where he is coming from that, that moment in time mm -hmm. where he, what he's feeling. And then you can be like, okay, today's not a good day to ask about when are you going to do this? Or, you know, you can be more sensitive to, to that. Yes, because if his critical part is already on high alert, uh, if he feels as though he is criticizing himself for not getting the garage clean, for an example, or not getting a door up, for an example, if he's already hard on himself in that area, and if I didn't know about it, I would say, hey, you know, you know, when are we going to get those doors put up? When are, when are those going to be installed? So he would then feel even worse or he'll react mm -hmm. and another part of him will react to protect himself from being hurt. But if I'm already aware of how he feels, then I can have empathy and compassion. And I'm curious as well of why he feels that way. And many times we will go in and say, would you like to talk about that part? What is your part? Why are you feeling, why is your critical part out today? And if he doesn't feel like talking, then I respect his space and I will shut down. And then many times that has happened and I'm triggered and I feel as though <laughs> uh, he doesn't appreciate or validate my feelings. So that's where being adopted, you can, you just bounce off of each other's parts and until you're in your, like your adult self, mm. 
which is very crucial. It's where we want to be. But we also have to appreciate and understand that those parts are not our enemies, that they are there to protect our child that was traumatized, hurt, abandoned, in the womb even, I believe. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. That's very insightful. And uh, I mean, I just think we have so many of these situations like on a daily basis. And just the fact that you guys are having these discussions and you're you're working away at it every day. And that's great. And I know you said we're a work in progress, but you know, a lot of people just stay stuck. And so it's pretty great that you are um you're both working at your relationship together. And I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm always, (laughs) I don't know how to say this exactly, but I'm really thankful that Nick is my husband. He's so like stable and normal because I just feel like a basket case most of the time. And so I don't know how I could take care of someone else that is like me. So it just must take a lot more of your emotional energy to, to be cognizant, so much more cognizant of the other person. Yes, it is. It's very emotionally draining. It's, uh, it could be a lot of time consuming with trying to even, as though we're on high alert with one another. I think that may be a good term is we are both on high alert. We want to make sure that we don't step on each other's toes, hurt each other's feelings. (laughs) Do you have any advice for other adoptees who are married to adoptees before we do our recommended resources? I would, I would say to stop and just listen to one another and, and know that yes, trauma is trauma, no matter what type of trauma and loss is it's pain, but we all process it differently in different seasons of our lives. So what I what I may have experienced and overcome in certain areas, it may take longer for the other person to process and overcome in that area of of their loss and pain and finding their true identity. Thank you. So let's do our recommended resources and. The thing I want to recommend today is Adoptees Connect. So our mutual friend, Pamela Caranova, has founded Adoptees Connect to be, well, she started out just wanting a peer-led adoptee-centric support group. And, And that's amazing. Like there's so many groups that are for the whole constellation. And, you know, as you were saying, Stephanie, just having how you and and your husband sort of trigger each other. I don't know if you've been in a support group situation with an adoptive parent before, but I don't do so well in that space. Um, so so Pamela wanted to create a space, safe <laughs> space for just adoptees to, to do peer support. And so she started the website adopteesconnect.com and, and other support groups, adoptee peer support groups across the U.S. are popping up. And there's her first location, Lexington, Kentucky, which you have been, right? Yes. Yes. Even though it's a long drive for you, but... No. No? Not a long drive? How long? No, not at all. I can arrive there within 60 minutes. An hour. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, you know, I would say that's a long drive, but anyway, just 60 minutes and you can be with your, your... Fellow adoptees. That's awesome. And then I started a support group as well in my city. And so we're joining up with Adoptees Connect as well. So that's kind of fun. And and the network is kind of growing. And and all it takes is one person in one place to get adoptees together and get connected. And Pamela has written out some great group guidelines and um, she's working on some different like resources, manuals, those kind of things for the leaders. So even if you haven't done something like this before, 
you can, you can do it. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage you to go to adopteesconnect.com to read a little bit more about what Pamela has started there. And if, if you're craving adoptee community and you're wanting to get connected with other adult adoptees in your area, I mean, maybe you're the one to start it. So I also did that healing series episode about how to start a support group with Jeanette Yoff, and she gave some great advice in that as well. And so those two resources combined, I think, are pretty great. So I love Pamela. I know you do too. Yes, she's going to be my roomie for Indianapolis Adoptee Convention. I ha- I, she was my roomie last year. <laughs> She's trading up. (laughs) We will miss you. Yes, I'm not able to come. By the time this airs, it will already have happened. But um, yeah, big, big event. Okay, Stephanie, what did you want to uh, recommend to us today? I was going to uh, recommend. I was part of being a a contributor for the Adoptee Survival Guidebook. It's 30 of uh, adoptees sharing their stories their experiences through adoption. And you can find us on the Facebook, The Adoptee Survival Guide. The editor is Lynn Grubb. I love the name of it. I mean, the name of that book is just like perfect. Don't That's exactly what we need, right? A survival guide. Yes. How do you navigate <laughs> this? Yes, it is. It is excellent. So you you wrote a chapter in that book then? Yes, I did. Yes. And what did you share about in your chapter? I shared about being adopted as a newborn and then the shock of finding out about my adoption and then the shock of finding out about my racial identity Mm -hmm. and then my husband being adopted as well. Okay. So you unpack a lot of what we talked about today. You unpack that in that book. That's great. And is there any, anything else in that book that you just want to highlight or point to it's great uh, resources for with the DNA, all the many matches that are out there. There's very, uh, there's some authors in there that have specialized in the genealogy and the DNA matching that some resources you can find as well. Oh, that's great. So if you're searching and you're looking for some tips on that. Yes. That's a good resource for that. Yeah, I actually met Lynn last year when I was at the Indiana Adopting Network Conference and she was presenting and that's awesome that she's put this together and that you're a part of it. That's great. Yes, thank you. You can also go online. I believe they have a website. We have, I believe, the Adoptee Survival Guide.com as well as Facebook. Yes, I see uh, the Adoptee Survival Guide.com and then... There's also the Facebook page. Thank you. We'll definitely check that out. And where can we connect with you online, Stephanie? You can connect with me online with Facebook at Stephanie Harris. I believe it is S-T-E-P-H-A-N-I-H-A-R-R-I-S. There's no E on Stephanie. I have Stephanie, S-T-E-P-H-A-N-I dot Harris on the Facebook.com slash that. That's correct. Great. I will link to that in the show notes. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us and also sharing about how therapy is really helping you and your husband um, build your relationship. That was really an important thing for us to hear. If Stephanie piqued your interest in IFS therapy, or if just Thinking about intimate partnerships as an adopted person, how tricky and vulnerable it makes you feel and like scared or if you're struggling in your marriage, any of those things, next week's episode is going to be so helpful. Marta is back. She's the IFS therapist we talked to last week and we're going to dive into this very topic. So make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss it. It's a really, really helpful episode. Other ways you can stay connected. There's the Adoptees On newsletter, adopteeson.com slash newsletter. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. All of our social media links are on the website, adopteeson.com. And I just want to say a gigantic thank you to each of you who share this show with your friends, who tag us on Instagram or Twitter. 
or you actually, with word of mouth, tell your friends about it. I know some of you have been talking about it in your support groups. It has been a good discussion starter for you with your partners. Some of you have talked about downloading the show when you're going on road trips, which is so fun. I get to go on a road trip with you. I love that. So thank you. Thank you for sharing the show. And I also want to just extend a giant thank you to those of you who are supporting the show financially through Patreon or one-time gifts. You're making it possible for this show to continue. If you're interested in partnering with me, if you're interested in joining the Secret Adoptees Only Facebook group or accessing the unedited versions of the show, I would love to have you come and partner with me. Adoptiesoncom slash partner has the details for monthly support. And I just thank you. Thank you so much. I literally wouldn't be able to do the show without you. Thank you so much for listening. Let's talk again next Friday.